cool. So I'm recording. Great. Um, quite a lot of people, when they talk about a controller, PID is such a common algorithm that for a large fraction of control people, when you say controller and you give no additional information, you probably mean a PID controller. Also, when you say controller and you mean a PID controller, that covers all the different uh, kinds of the PID controller. So for, for most people, people will say this is a PID controller even if there is no derivative action or even if there is no integral action. So in other words, most people will think of PID as being the box and then I have knobs right, for P and I and D, and one of the positions of those knobs is off, right? So they typically don't, you don't find on shelves uh, special PD controller boxes anymore. You used to because obviously um, those components have to be built into the controller, but due to the economies of scale, it's actually much cheaper to build universal PID controllers and just have a knob that you can turn and then they're all the same and you don't have to spend time constructing a special proportional controller and a special PI controller and a special PID controller. So this is just a little bit of nomenclature that I find a lot of times students will say, but sir, you said design a PID controller but there's no derivative action in this controller. What's up with that? Or, you said we were going to do PID parameters, but half the stuff in the table is just for PI. Um, a PI controller, in this sense, is a PID controller, right? So it's useful to kind of explain what you mean if you are talking about a particular uh, instantiation of the controller. It's, it's more useful to say, this is a controller without derivative action because most people will assume all three of those knobs are there. So, I specifically used a very ambiguous word in this heading because I think I need to spend a little bit of time unpacking what good means. Um, when we talk about controllers. Because I see there's a lot of people who are, are kind of not 100% not following the, the direction that this chapter is taking. So, the first thing I want to have clear in everybody's mind is that if we start with this idea of uh, what a controller is supposed to do. A controller is supposed to do if, if the entire system looks like this, and there's like commands coming in, and a response coming out, we say that the job of the controller is to make sure that the response most closely resembles the command. Right, So this is kind of the, the goal. And if we use our mathematical notation for this, we'll call this YSP, and we'll call this Y. And that's one version of what it means to be good, right? So goodness in this sense tells me how close is the response to the command. And so if I were, if I were to plot this, I would have a graph that looks something like this. And I'm going to kind of zoom out so that time zero, you know, usually we start with time zero kind of on the left-hand side of the axis and zero on the kind of at the origin. I'm going to kind of make this so that it's a little clearer. I'm going to zoom it like this and say, let's imagine that we have this uh, command. And now you can kind of say the best kind of control and what you've heard me refer to as perfect control, right? Perfect control has a response that lies entirely on top of that command. Okay, so if that is Y is P, and that is Y, 
That's perfect control. And you've heard me speak at length about why, uh, why this is not possible, right? So in most cases, this is not possible to achieve primarily because of the problems in inverting the process transfer function model. So if I have a, so the kind of controller that would give me perfect control would typically involve the calculation of the inverse of the plant. Because like one version of what's inside of this box uh, could be something like this. Actually, let me just make that a bit darker. So that's one version of what's in the box, right? It's just, well, there's this thing, and that thing on the left, the inverse of the plant, that's the controller in this concept, and uh, the thing on the right is the actual plant, and if I have a perfect inverse of the plant, then I have perfect control. Why can't I get perfect control? Because in most, of, most cases, the inverse of the plant is not physically realized. So even if I have a really great model, I wouldn't be able to implement something that actually calculated the inputs. There's a second problem, which is that our models are never perfect. So even if I have an invertible plant model, so if I have something like a lead lag unit for my plant model, I could invert that, but the odds that I would get everything 100% correct is so low that I still wouldn't get perfect control. But it's a good idea to say, well, this is what we strive for. Right? Perfect control is the, is the ultimate goal. We can't get better than perfect control. Um, now, more realistically, we're not going to shoot for perfect control. We're going to shoot for this kind of feedback version of control. And we're going to just have our normal control structure. Right? And so what's inside the box now, it's the same idea, but we've now got a goal of, uh, let's say, acceptable control. And now we have a couple of definitions, right? So we can say, good control in my world looks like getting the response that I choose from the whole control system. So when the set point moves, in a stepwise fashion, I could say, well, I think pretty good, a, a pretty good definition of good control is if I can choose the response. <coughs> right? And that give gives rise to two different kinds of control design strategy, right? So that's the basis of both direct synthesis and the IMC method. So if, if what it means to get good control is defined as I want to be able to choose how the system response will look like. Now it's not perfect, right? It's not doing exactly what I said. But it is doing something different in a way that is completely within my choosing. So I choose that it's a first order response with a particular time constant or whatever, and then that I define as good control. And I can go and design using the direct synthesis method or IMC. What's the difference between direct synthesis and IMC in this case? Direct synthesis gives you less guidelines about how to go about achieving this. They're both based on exactly the same idea. Both of them say, you choose, I choose what the response is going to look like. And then I design my controller according to, to that. In direct synthesis, it's the simpler version of this. I simply uh, solve for the controller. So I, oops, what's happened there? So I, I take 
I take this, I put it in the overall closed loop transfer function, I know GP and I solve for GC. With IMC, I've got a slightly more complicated flow diagram or a block diagram. I've got a, a, a model in parallel to the plant. And this just enables me to more uh, quickly find the correct version of the controller. Because the IMC process, the idea that we split the uh, plant model into an invertible and a non-invertible part, means that we immediately get, by design, by just following the steps, we immediately get a physical realizable controller, just like automatically, where that didn't happen in direct synthesis. Remember, in direct synthesis, I may have had to guess a couple of times to get a good, uh, uh, to get a good controller. Um, but they both have this property, and I want you to be absolutely clear on that, that IMC also has this property that we, we know the closed loop response. We choose the closed loop response. Right? So we choose the actual transfer function for the closed loop response. It's basically equal to G plus times the filter. You can have a look in the textbook about that. So, so it's a known thing. So we know, and what that encapsulates is, remember, I had all those rules on the table about direct synthesis of like, well, you can't get a faster response than with the dead time, so you have to include the dead time. Now, IMC just formalizes that, right? It just says, well, that dead time, that in direct synthesis, you had to kind of keep track of in your head. Well, we'll just put that in this place called uh, this specific factorization of G, and we only try and invert the part that we can invert. So we don't try and invert those bad poles, and we don't try and invert uh, dead time because obviously that would, would not work. So we just bypass that. So that's a, another kind of definition of what good control looks like. These methods that I've uh, discussed so far all have this thing in common, that, that we are choosing, the thing that we are defining as good is being able to choose what the response looks like. Right? Then we have a whole different way of doing things, which is not about choosing exactly the closed-loop transfer function or specifying what that closed-loop transfer function uh, looks like, but rather about characterizing the response using uh, different measurements of goodness. And I've mentioned this before, that... Many of these measures are based on a prototypical uh, second-order response. And so, for instance, uh, and the, the, the various different names of this. Um, so here we have the overshoot. Right there we have the rise time. And if we, if we look at the amount of time that it takes to get within some amount of uh, distance from that, from the set point, we have the settling time. And then we have this thing called the decay ratio, which is kind of like uh, which is like V over A. So, we've got all of these different kind of metrics, and then we can say one of two things. We can either target particular values of those metrics, and two of the methods in the book are based on the idea of targeting a one-quarter decay ratio, the Ziegler-Nichols method, and what's in the textbook uh, just called the constant oscillation method, but it, which is actually the Cohen-Kuhn method. Um, both of them are designed around this idea that it's a good idea to target particularly this, and this is, let's say, it's an arbitrary number, but it's a, it's a widely used number, which is to say, well, we'll choose the settings, we'll either twiddle with the knobs until we get that done, or we'll actually do the math and then build big tables that you can use to get to those values. And these are then methods based on this idea. So, so in other words, we, we, we don't have an exact formula because the response may actually not be an actual second-order response. Right? It may be like a fourth-order response 
but which resembles this oscillatory response. And definitely, if you're working with a real plant, it may not be a linear response at all, right? Like it may be like some weird non-linear set of relationships, but by and large, when you have a system under PI control, if you have at least PI, uh, P and I action, you'll remember that if I add some integral action, I'll, I'll add a tendency to oscillation just because I'll have to have like positive and negative parts of the error to cancel out that, uh, or to stabilize that error integral, right? So whenever I turn that integral knob a little too far, I'll inevitably get oscillation. I'll, I'll get oscillation even if I don't have integral action, uh, if I have large gains on higher order processes. So it's not about the actual math. We can do the math for second-order systems under proportional control, have second-order closed-loop responses, or second-order closed-loop transfer functions. First-order systems under PI control also have second-order responses. But basically, if the order of the system gets any higher than that, you'll have some kind of a complex, <laughs> large, uh, high-order transfer function. But in most cases, they, there will be a set of uh, complex poles, and that will give rise to this kind of behavior. Okay? And so, as soon as you have a little bit of oscillation or overshoot, you have the opportunity to start using these words. So you can say, oh yes, well I notice there's a little bit of overshoot in that control. Or I notice there's that, that controller has a lower rise time than that controller. And you can imagine that the application of these words to, or to describe the goodness of control is very situational, right? So, so it may be, for instance, that if, I'm, if my job is to design a missile, for instance, like a rocket, that is supposed to hit the target as soon as possible, I may not worry that it has large overshoot, because if it does its job right, it just gets there. Its job is to get there as soon as possible and then explode, right? So the overshoot doesn't exist in my design. If I have some... Uh, posturization process where I'm trying to heat up a bottle of milk and it's incredibly important that I don't go above a certain temperature or for instance a very classic example is posturization, posturization of <laughs> eggs so you may not know this but like you can posturize eggs but you can posturize them without cooking them but you have to be very careful so that you posturize them and you don't cook them now what does that mean that means if I want to have an efficient process, I want to get the eggs up to temperature quite quickly, right? So it's, the rise time is important, but it is very important that I don't have any overshoot. And so you can see there's no universal way. Those two pictures that I've given you, the one with the rocket that is just meant to hit the target and explode, and the one with the egg that's not supposed to go over a certain temperature, it's the situation that makes the metric. So this is why you can't say, oh, well, here is the metric. I, I've, I've discovered what is the correct number to use for goodness in control. Goodness is about matching what you need from a control system with what the control system actually does. So in most cases, the first thing that you need to know is that these things aren't completely fixed. The most common question I get from students in this section especially on the direct synthesis and IMC techniques, are like, but how do I choose? Now I just have a new problem. You've said that I don't have to choose three controller parameters, the P and the I and the D. I can just choose tau C, the time constant of my desired response. But how do I choose that? And the answer is, well, it depends, doesn't it? Right? It depends on what your particular system is like. And this is why it's very difficult to solve these kinds of problems without some story around it. Right? So if I tell you the story of the eggs, you're going to be in a much better position to understand the requirements than if I just say a particular process is described by transfer function, right? Here's a transfer function, find the best controller for the transfer function. Well, that's an impossible problem. Why is it impossible? Because just the math doesn't tell me what's important in the system. It's the words that does that. Right? It's the fact that I've told you a story about an egg, and I've told, and people maybe know that eggs shouldn't be cooked when they get to you, or you know, all of that information is how you figure out what the control requirements are. 
Now, in some cases, it's going to be accessible to you. So maybe you're using, you know, you're driving or you're doing something like that. In some cases, it's so obvious that you don't really think about it. So it actually needs a bit of time for you to think about, like, what is exactly. So if I told you, you're trying to control the temperature of your shower, what's important? Probably overshoot is not great if you're trying to temperature control the shower, right? Like because we scald at a relatively low, well, the temperature at which we scald is quite close to the temperature that I like my shower. And so uh, it's not going to be great for me to have a controller. I want to get there quickly because I also don't like having a cold shower. But I don't want to get there quickly at the cost of at some point being bathed in 100 degrees Celsius water. But so these kind of things, this is what makes the requirements of a controller, right? Now there's a whole different class. So I've, I've discussed these two kinds, right? So IMC and, D, uh, and uh, direct synthesis, they are choose the response and then do the math and find the controller that does exactly that, right? Um, then you've got a whole lot of different methods. And these are kind of, people say, okay, I'm going to try and just find a kind of a, a method by which you can, you can characterize the process and you'll see that some of these methods are characterization of the process based. In other words, they'll be like, do a step response and find that and then you've got a first order plus dead time model. And I've done the math up front for a first order plus dead time model under the assumption of a one quarter decay ratio. And if you use table whatever, whatever, you'll be able to get the same results that I got. And then there's this other clause, which is, well, don't even worry. You're never going to write down the actual process model. You're just going to twiddle the, the, the knobs until you get the desired behavior that you're looking at. You'll be very surprised, or you may be surprised, or I was very surprised, perhaps. But let's just keep it inside of me. I was very surprised that like, this, that, that method, that like, twiddle the knobs until you kind of get what you want, is actually the, by far the most common way that controllers are true. Um, Partly because people are lazy, but they're lazy with their brains, they're not lazy with their time, right? So the other stuff is cognitively demanding, like doing Laplace mathematics is cognitively demanding. Turning knobs while you're watching YouTube is not cognitively demanding, right? So, so you can have, it may take a lot longer, so as a general rule, the online tuning methods are a lot slower in time, in actual total hours from an untuned state to a tuned state. But they are also more, uh, by, but they are also easier to do. Because you can kind of just do it intuitively. The other methods are conceptually more difficult, and they, but they, they pay for that by being faster. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, so does everybody understand the stuff that I've just been talking about, right? So you've, you, you've got like broad strokes, right? One big class, which is like, I'm going to choose the response and do the math. One big class, which is I'm going to not actually choose the response exactly, but I'm going to choose the nature of the response <coughs> measured by one of these time domain measures. Um, you know, overshoot or rise time or whatever. And I'm just going to target that. Those methods typically, due to the kind of requirements of what we do, include an approximation step. So they'll be like, well, it's, it's quite hard to calculate this one quarter decay ratio thing for a fifth order system. So we'll first approximate that big hairy system by a first order plus dead time or a second order plus dead time. And then uh, we'll consult the published literature where somebody has done a PhD on finding those coefficients. And then we'll just use those coefficients. So that's basically all the stuff, all the other tuning methods that were developed in the 70s are like that. Um, and then you have this, it's a slightly more modern idea because it is also kind of a little bit more mathematically sophisticated. And this is the integral-based methods. Um, now, so the integral-based methods differ from the time domain methods by the fact that we're not using particular points. So let me just maybe label these, right? So these are like choose the response and do the math. <coughs> so we've got choose the response and do the math, time response, the time domain performance, and integral.
So these integral methods, they all have a definition of good which is a little bit related to the curve fitting that we did last year in the process identification. Now, and I want to have that analogy uh, quite strong in your mind. You'll remember that we had this idea of, of doing linear regression, right? And we said that if you do linear regression, one way of defining that kind of line of best fit is to say that I've got some kind of an error, and that error is going to be the sum of, uh, you know, like y minus y data squared. And okay, maybe if I, if I really want to, I can also t take the square root of that, right? And that was the basis of linear regression. That's exactly what we used. We said, okay, if we have, uh, we have some known observation and we have some measured observation, or we have some predicted observation, we have some measured observation, we add all the differences squared and we minimize that, right? And we said that we minimize that with respect to this parameterized curve. And so that, that worked really well for uh, all kinds of stuff that was linear in the coefficients, because if you take the derivative of that, uh, if, you, if you understand firstly that the square root doesn't change the answer, because it's a monotonic function, and then you end up, okay, so we've got this kind of lot big sum of squares, if I take the big sum of squares and I take the derivative of that, why am I taking the derivative? Because I'm trying to optimize, right? I'm finding the minimum. Everybody knows to find the minimum, one method is to take the derivative and set equal to zero. So if I take the derivative of second order polynomials, I end up with first order polynomials and I'm in the pound seat because first order polynomials are awesome, linear systems are easy to solve. Okay, and that was the whole basis of uh, linear regression. And what, now that I've got you kind of just back in that place, I want you to, to understand how analogous that is to the integral performance measures for control. Because the integral performance measures says, let's take this error and let's just, instead of doing the discrete version where I take the sum of the difference between uh, what I want and what I got, right? Why don't I just take the integral over time of that. Does everybody see how strong that relationship is? It's the same thing, right? It's basically the same thing, except the one is on a signal and the other one is on discrete points. In fact, if I gave you that integral to work out in NumPy, one way to do it would be to calculate lots of different points and then actually do the, the right-hand part. Right, so calculate lots of them in a spreadsheet. Calculate the differences and then add them all up. You'd get the same optimal uh, result. Now, this, this basic idea of saying, well, we'll just, so, and what they're basically saying is, let's choose this as our definition of good. And if you draw it through, they're basically saying, let's just say that our definition of good is how close you get to the set point measured over time in this particular way. Does that idea make sense to everybody? So they're just saying, it's, a, it's, a, it's just another way of thinking about what is good when I talk about control, right? So first I said good is getting exactly what I want. Now I'm saying good is getting as close as possible. I know I can't get exactly what I want. I just know that already, right? Like because perfect control is impossible. But instead of now having to choose, or because remember, in the math where I had to choose, what's the problem? I don't know what tau c is. I don't even know how to choose it. I can get whatever I want if I know what to choose, but I don't know what to choose. So this is a way of abdicating that responsibility and saying, no, just give me the best you can. You know, just get as close as you can, really. Right? Try, try and get as close as you can and stay as close as you can for as long as you can. That's pretty much a good definition of control. And now you can see that there are some situational problems. Because this particular thing here, this is known as the integral of the square error. <coughs> and 
one consequence of using the integral of the square error is that it's, it's going to fight very hard to try and make this area very small. Because that's the biggest error area most of the time. And the problem is, as we've seen before, there's this trade-off, right? There's this trade-off between the rise time and the, and the settling rate and stuff. And so what often will happen with ISE controllers is that it, like, it's trying so hard to reduce that initial error that it doesn't really care much about small errors that persist towards the right of this curve over there. And so like a sticking plaster on that problem is to use a time-weighted version of this. Is to say, oh, no, 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 what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to add in here a time term. And what that will mean is that when time is small, the error won't be very important, or it won't contribute much to... So this is a way of kind of waiting and saying, what's really important to me is that we have very low errors eventually. Right? Errors at the right-hand side of time is much more important than errors initially, because we, had, we know we're going to get errors initially. So this is actually like the time-weighted ISE, and you'll know that the textbook doesn't even have that in it. Um, the, the, the versions that are common are uh, the integral of the absolute error, because now you can imagine this square thing is a lot more penalizing on large errors than on small errors. I mean, errors that deviate a lot. And so this is slightly... So this is the integral of the absolute error, and then there's this like time-weighted integral of the absolute error. Integral of the time-weighted absolute error. And I think I have time to actually show you the mechanics of how this actually works, because I hope this kind of big summary now, this kind of summarizes basically all of that chapter, all of this chapter. Everything in, the, everything in this tuning chapter is one of these three methods, right? Either I'm defining good as going exactly the function I want, or I'm defining good as some other kind of observation about what the result looks like, or I'm using some kind of integral measure to define goodness. And a lot of people have trouble understanding how they would actually go about uh, doing this. Now, I am going to show you how I've done this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in this lecture waving my hands a little bit about one very specific thing which I would like to dedicate like a whole lecture to, but um, that is in terms of operationally just for tomorrow's type, not that important for you to understand how it works. Um, which is actually how I do the, how I do the actual simulation. Um, and I also want to kind of just uh, highlight that there are, in all of these methods, there are two completely separate operational aspects of doing the method. The one part is actually understanding what the method does, how it works, how IMC works, how direct synthesis works, and how you would get to every one of the entries in table 11.1, for instance. Okay, so that's like thing number one that you get out of this, is like understanding how those methods work. But operationally, there are tables. And that's kind of thing number two, is that in most cases, how people do this is not by rederiving all those things from first principles, but rather by consulting pre-developed tables. It's much the same as when we did CIR and we did like thermodynamic properties, right? And I can show you, oh, you know, here's like the Wilson model, or this is this other model, or whatever, and there's all these different models, and you can see how they work, and I can show you the math, and we can do a lot of problems where we do all the math. And then eventually, how you're actually going to find what the CP of a certain substance is, is you're going to open up Perry, or you're going to go online, or whatever, and you're just going to find the CP for that substance. Right? So these are kind of very different skills. Being able to find that thing from first principles, and being able to actually use that thing to do something in the world. 
I want you to be able to do both of those things, but the first is more important than the second in this subject. Because using a table for me is like, well, that's trivial, right? Um, and I've, I've encapsulated some of the more tricky parts of the tables into code, which I'm going to share with you now. Right, so let's just talk about this, uh, like how we actually do this. Here I've got a recreation of uh, the model parameters for uh, using integral uh, or minimal integral measures. So this is the stuff that I've just been speaking about uh, on the iPad, which is kind of how do I find, how do I define good? I define good as minimizing the error in some way integra integrated over uh, time. So also you'll see that I'm not going to be speaking a lot about the same exact idea, but in terms of the uh, disturbance signal. So you'll see this notebook is all about like minimizing the error in set point tracking. You can do exactly the same thing by saying, well, I, what's also important is to minimize the amount of deviation that I get after a disturbance happens. And then you get a different set of parameters. So in general, disturbance rejection and set point tracking have slightly different optimal parameters. Now, this idea, this general idea, is often also known as optimal control. So if you Google it, there's a lot of stuff about optimal control. Uh, now, I have tried my hardest to make the simulation part of this as easy as I know how to understand, uh, at least from a high level. So you don't know how I did this, but I'm sure that you will understand what I'm doing. I will sp still talk about this. I've developed this library called Blocksim, which basically allows you to specify the blocks and the connectivity of a block diagram and then magically obtain a simulation. I say magic, but obviously the code is right there in the repository. Like You can go and look at how I did it. Uh, but basically how it works is you create a block for each of the blocks. So there's a GC and a GP. Uh, GP is a LTI system. These first parts are the name of the block itself, the name of the input, and the name of the output of that block. It's actually, th those names are actually used to figure out the math, so you have to use the names in a consistent way. You can't just call them Charles or whatever. Um, so these correspond exactly with the diagram that I have over here. Uh, so these are the blocks, then you've got uh, input specification, so this is like a dictionary containing functions that retain, that, uh, functions of time that return the value of the set point. So in this case, YSP is just one all the time, but um, obviously the, the system allows me to put in a sinusoid or whatever in there. And then you have another dictionary that specifies the sums in this kind of little mini language where uh, you, you have a dictionary, the key of the dictionary is the output of the sum, and then you have a tuple that specifies the various inputs into the sum. You have to specify the plus. So, so in other words, here this E is YSP minus Y. Um, e is YSP minus Y. Right, so you have to specify the pluses. Then you build a diagram using those blocks and those sums and those inputs, and then that diagram has this simulate method that you can just simulate. It outputs all the different values of all the signals. So it'll have a dictionary with Y, P, and E, and U, and Y. Uh, and in this case, I'm just looking at Y. Um, and so when we actually do that, this is what it looks like.